video is sponsored by the free-to-play online game War Thunder. Go to my link in the description for a free premium tanker aircraft and three days of premium time for signing up. More on that in a second. In the last few iterations of meme tanks, I've gone with themes for the videos and the vehicles selected. But the other day, I went back and watched Meme Tanks 2, probably my favorite one if I'm being honest, and decided that for this one, I really want to go back to the old system of picking three for no specific reason other than they make me laugh. Something that I think has been lost in translation with the recent videos. With a lot of people thinking a meme tank means a bad tank, when a lot of the designs I pick are actually really capable vehicles, they just have some sort of quirk or thing that sets them apart that makes them memeable. A phenomenon that I think is perfectly relayed in our first vehicle. And remember, you only take it when you need it. The Vickers 6 ton was actually a fairly old tank by the time it was being used on a large scale. Designed in 1928 by the Vickers Armstrong Company, it was a fairly cheap, simple, and reliable tank that, after working out some of the kinks and going through a few different model types, was presented to the British Army, where it was quickly rejected by them. They had more important things to invest in, like Christie suspension, and felt that the 6-tonner didn't have the cross-country capability they wanted. It was at this point, though, that it was put onto the world market as a type of low-cost form of armor design. And like a brand name wonder drug, began being sold all over the world to cure armies of armor tile dysfunction. Are you having trouble with home defense? Is your neighbor's military might interfering with your daily life? Talk to your Minister of Defense about Vickers 6 Ton, a cheap and effective way to secure your military might and secure your borders. Don't let your enemies keep you from running your own country, and get the defensive power that you need. Make the switch to an armored battalion of Vickers 6 Ton today. Ask your generals if your military is healthy enough for war. Do not import Vickers 6 Tonners if your country is under military sanctions. Side effects may include increased fuel consumption, larger numbers of enemy anti-tank guns, and dependence on roads for transport. To avoid long-term attrition, get diplomatic help for a conflict lasting more than four years. Viva! The Vickers 6 Ton. The design really came into its own when the generic version of the tank in the form of foreign developments began being created locally by several countries, most notably the Polish 7TP and the Soviet T-26, which they created in eye-watering numbers of up to 11,000 and upwards of 53 different variants, which were themselves exported to other countries from the Soviet Union, showing up in conflicts like the Spanish Civil War and in China against the Japanese. You'd even have Vickers-type models fighting other Vickers-type models during the Soviet invasion of Poland and during the Winter War, where the Finn used their own six-ton tanks, not to very good effect, against T-26s, but later capturing and reusing T-26s against Soviet T-26s in the Continuation War. By the late 30s, the Vickers design had replaced the FT for the world's idea of what tanks were supposed to be, and was one of the designs most widely used in these small conflicts popping up, eventually culminating in the Second World War. It was British engineering that was being used as one of the biggest mechanical death-dealing machines across the planet, creating a very understandable sense of patriotism in British subjects, looking back on their ingenuity, driving forward the tools of war making, showing that the influence of British ideas was not waning, although their empire may have been, announcing to the world that... Development of better anti-tank guns, though, caused the demise of the machine, with the last large-scale use of them being in 1945 in Manchuria by the Red Army against the Japanese. The OI is a Japanese super-heavy tank that was largely forgotten until it was catapulted into common knowledge from being included in a lot of tank simulator games. The gigantic multi-turreted design really sticks out from the other tanks used by the Japanese military that are known for being smaller, lighter designs originating in the 1930s. This vehicle, like many, many other things to do with the Japanese army, was once again a result of the Japanese army's rough experience in Mongolia against the Soviets in 1939. The Japanese Chief of Army Affairs after the incident ordered Colonel Matra of the 4th Technical Research Institute to create a, quote, giant chariot used as a mobile pillbox on the vast plains of Manchuria, with the idea being that this large vehicle, immune to anti-tank guns, would be the spearhead of a Japanese attack accompanied by lighter tanks and mobile infantry that would be able to destroy enemy anti-tank gun positions and open up the way for the rest of the armored force. And the requirements for the tank were that it was to be about twice the weight and size in all areas as the Type 95 heavy tank. The project began its life under the name Mito, and similarly to the supersized battleships that the Japanese made, the project for the supersized tanks was extremely secretive. The plans were ready by 1941 and construction began. 
The lack of funding and the extreme secrecy of the project drug the whole process out into 1943, about four times longer than was planned. Once finally completed enough for testing, it was renamed the OI, and on the day of testing, it's claimed to have weighed 96 tons, excluding the turret and 75 millimeters of bolt-on front armor. During trials, the vehicle damaged its suspension and sunk into the mud. Once it was recovered and fixed, it was tested again on a concrete surface that apparently utterly destroyed and damaged its suspension again, to where it was eventually scrapped sometime in 1943 or 44, possibly after some time sitting untouched in a field in one of the testing grounds. And all that is left of the vehicle today is a single track link. Now this is the official story of the OI. But as some of you may know, it's a whole lot more complicated than that. A lot of the information about the tank comes mostly from the memories of engineers who worked on it, with only a few documents to back up their claims with. For example, in Hara's book, he says that the main gun was 105 millimeters, whereas design documents and blueprints say it was 150. And there are all sorts of discrepancies like this with the design. The total weight for a long time was thought to be 150 tons, but that's recently been called into question and regarded as untrue. Even within the story of the tank's development, there are a lot of discrepancies to do with the timeline, how many prototypes were built, and how the thing was scrapped, if it even was scrapped, with some saying that it was dropped into a lake after surviving until 1945, and so on. Everywhere I looked when researching for this video, I got different answers with a lot of articles and book chapters basically ending with this big shrug and the author saying that they just don't know for sure. In 2015, original documents were found and purchased by the Fine Molds Company to make models with, and they allow people to look at the documents after paying a rather steep price to do so. But a lot of people who have done this didn't cite their sources for what they later write about on the OI, which may be some kind of legal thing as part of being able to see them. And the whole story is just a mess and one of the biggest head scratchers as far as World War II tanks go, and a really unique story for a vehicle which makes the OI for me the most mysterious tank of World War II, having one of the most memeable traits with the sheer amount of mystery surrounding it. Oh yeah, damn, damn boy. In the early days of the channel, I made a video about the Sturmtiger, and even though the video did pretty well, I get requests for it to be in a meme tanks video all the time, and you know I'm here to please. Nice. The Sturmtiger was a late war variant of the Bunker Buster infantry support vehicle. Because as German tanks got big dickier, this categories of vehicles got bigger as well, and you know the joke I'm gonna make. <laughs> the Sturmtiger, created out of surplus late war Tiger I hulls, with the exception of the prototype being on an early war chassis, mounted a 380mm L5.4 chip gun that unlike previous vehicles of this type, actually used a two-stage rocket system. The first stage, blowing the projectile from the barrel, and the second stage being a rocket propulsion system inside the projectile that would launch the monstrous warhead to its target. And all these vehicles were pretty scruffy. As I mentioned in previous videos, the Germans are notorious for changing a lot of features on their tanks within a production run. But the Sturmtiger takes this to a whole new level, with changes being made between each of the 18 units built. Mostly as a product of being developed and manufactured kind of at the same time. Once created, they were split up into three armored assault mortar companies, with Company 1000 seeing the first and only time the vehicle was used in its role at the Warsaw Uprising, where it knocked buildings down as it was intended to. The vehicles also saw service in the Ardennes Offensive and around Remagen, with a less than stellar performance as they were often found abandoned by the side of the road by bewildered GIs after they ran out of fuel or ammunition and could not keep moving. And the vehicle itself is really a fun quirk in the annals of armored warfare, and as I said in my previous video, really kind of sums up to me how out of touch a lot of the German army was with their actual position in the war at this point. Spending resources on a vehicle that is intended for offensive capabilities when they've been on their back foot for a good while now. And if you ask me, the real genius of this design lies in the additional escape hatch via the gun tube that the vehicle provided. You know, they say the Sherman was the most survivable tank of the war, but you can't launch yourself out of the gun of a burning Sherman. You gotta get yourself out using a lame old hatch there. And this is the real kind of German ingenuity that has kind of brought me around to see what all those angry people in my Germany can't win World War II videos' comment sections are on about. You may only have a handful of shells, and it may be a near Herculean task for the only four crew members allotted to the vehicle to load and fire the thing. But being able to slide out of the gun tube like an absolute mad lad in a time of emergency? Now that takes some real engineering foresight. 
Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. War Thunder is a realistic free-to-play vehicle combat game where you can fight with over 12,000 vehicles from the 1930s to the 1990s in the air, on land, or at sea, including many a version of the Vickers 6 tonner for those who feel inspired by this video. It's available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One, but you know which one you should be playing it on. Come join the chaos for free by using my link in the description and get a free premium tanker aircraft and three days of premium time just for signing up. Word of advice to the new players though, don't lose your patience and bonsai right in. You may want to use that spanking new hago like the Japanese intended and push in right away in a glorious charge like your boy did, but that may not be the best strategy. Thank you to my patrons on Patreon for making these videos possible, some of who you'll see on screen, and supporting this very strange series. I've recently opened up a P.O. box to send out a few things and thought I'd mention it here if anyone has anything they feel the need to send my way for any reason, and if so, I'll make some videos opening fan mail on my community tab. As of now, it's open for three months, but if there's any interest, I'll keep it open longer. I'll have the address in the description. I also want to mention that my videos are now up on the streaming service Vlogbox, which can be found on services like Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and I believe Android TV. So if you've ever wanted to see a PH video on the big screen, you now have the ability to. Thank you to everyone for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.